Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you all for joining today's webinar to learn more about the effectiveness of multi-sectoral programming to improve nutrition-sensitive agriculture, nutrition, and health. My name is Devin Andrews. I'm the Communications Specialist for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition. I'll be your MC for this webinar today. As attendees are joining, I'll begin by going over some housekeeping items. I would like to direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom webinar. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation with other attendees. If you have a question for one of the panelists, please use the Q&A feature. Panelists will respond to questions in the Q&A box throughout the webinar, and we have allotted the final half hour of this webinar for Q&A. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, send a message in the chat box to all panelists so that our technical support staff can work with you to resolve them. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Nutrition Innovation Lab website and the USAID Advancing, Advancing Nutrition website. There you can also register for upcoming webinars and view recordings and slide decks of previous webinars. We will repeat these technical housekeeping items in the chat throughout the webinar as people may join at later times. I would like to begin by introducing Dr. Patrick Webb, who is the Director of the Innovation Lab for Nutrition and the Alexander McFarlane Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. He will provide a brief description of the Nutrition Innovation Lab before introducing the moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Webb, over to you. Thank you, Devin, and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to returning participants who've been in these webinars before, but also welcome to new um, entrants. This is the latest in the Nutrition Innovation Labs uh, series of webinars where we try and engage with stakeholders of all kinds uh, all over the world, not just in the countries in which we've been uh, pursuing uh, operations and frontier kinds of research. And we have an amazing lineup again today, uh, focusing on the very important um, issues uh, around uh, the design, implementation, and uh, impact assessment of multi-sector programming, specifically from a nutrition perspective. Um, the, now, this work uh, underpinned a lot of the Innovation Lab's work uh, over the recent years. Next slide. It's not the only topic of, of interest, but it's a, a very important key topic uh, for many program uh, implementers, donors, and governments as well. Uh, this slide shows you the, the kinds of uh, research, evidence, data collection, scientific activity that uh, the lab has been pursuing around the world. It's a lot of different countries, mainly focused in South Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but it goes beyond that. And it's a range of topics from randomized controlled trials to secondary data analysis to birth cohorts um, and beyond. Um, today, you're going to hear uh, evidence uh, from uh, close collaborators working in our some of our um, deep dive uh, countries, as we put it, uh, Nepal, Uganda, and Bangladesh, where uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time with local partners of many kinds, trying to get a handle on how uh, multi-sector programs meet the needs of uh, smallholder producers and consumers, uh, and what we can learn from their implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, this obviously is in collaboration with many different government partners in Washington and uh, the country missions, and we're very grateful to those partners for their activities and their support. So I'm going to uh, briefly introduce our amazing moderator today, Dale Davis, um, who's uh, been a close collaborator and colleague and friend uh, from the very beginning. Dale has a, a master's in public health and she's a country director for Helen Keller International, an NGO in Nepal and has been uh, for many years. She's got huge experience in uh, international health and nutrition and agriculture and uh, is a trusted provider of technical support and capacity building uh, to governments and NGOs uh, alike. And a lot of experience both in the design and assessment of the impact of multi-sector programs for nutrition, often including homestead food production, but also access to markets, micronutrient initiatives, and more. So we're very happy, very grateful to have you uh, moderate this session, Dale, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, 
and actually it's a, an honor for me to be able to be with you all this evening, this morning, um, today, uh, to, to share some of this uh, evidence, which is of such great importance in looking at how we make impactful decisions on multi-sectoral programming. And I'm very uh, pleased to be able to introduce our panel for, for today. Um, our first uh, panelist is uh, Nasul Kabunga. So Nasul is um, an evaluation research economist who is affiliated with the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. He holds a PhD in agriculture economics and rural development from the Göttingen University in Germany and has a master's degree from Hanover University in Germany and a Bachelor of Science from Makiri University in Kampala, Uganda. Over the past year, Nasul has been working as a consultant at the Uganda National Information Platforms for Nutrition to build capacity of national institutions in compiling and analyzing existing data sets so as to provide evidence-based policy and program interventions to improve nutrition outcomes. Our next presenter will be Nina Joshi. Um, so Nina is um, a development professional working in the field of community development. She serves as director of programs at the HEFA Project uh, International in Nepal and provides leadership in program development and management targeted towards alleviation of hunger and poverty and care for the earth. She has been engaged in various research works relating to social capital, child nutrition and gender, and bringing them into our, her program designs. Next, we have Laurie Miller, and many of you will be familiar with Laurie. Um, she is uh, M uh, a professor of pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine and the adjunct professor of nutrition at the Friedman School for Nutrition and Science Policy and Policy at Tufts University, and is the adjunct professor of child development at the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University. With support from USAID, the Nutrition Innovation Lab, and the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab, she has worked with HEF in Nepal to assess the health, nutritional status, and development of children in their project areas. Currently, she is a consulting pediatrician and child health researcher at St. Anne's Hospital and Necker Hospital Enfant Malade in Paris, France. And then uh, our final presenter this evening will be Katie Apple. Katie is an assistant researcher for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition. She has a Master's of Science in Food Policy and Applied Nutrition from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. And she has been with the Innovation Lab for Nutrition since 2016. So with that, I would like to hand over to Nasul to begin the presentations um, as our first panelist today. Thank you, Nasul. Uh, thank you, Dell. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And I'm honored really to be here this afternoon, uh, this evening, this morning. Uh, good afternoon, good morning everyone who is listening in. Um, my name is Nasul Kabunga, as introduced, and I've been working uh, affiliated with Tufts University since 2012. And my work in Uganda was essentially looking, overlooking, overseeing the evaluation of the USAID Community Connector Program in Uganda. We want to thank USAID for supporting this study. We want to thank other collaborators who have been helping us out, uh, stakeholders, several of them that we have talked to, and we are sure that um, you know the results that we get uh, will be of importance. Uh, please uh, go to the next slide. So um, think of a situation where you know you meet one of the programmers or policymakers, and they ask you. You know, you're talking about nutrition, the multisectoral sort of like approaches, but you know, and this has happened before. Which kind of of things could you quickly touch? to be able to address the malnutrition problem in a country like Uganda. And if you don't have the evidence to that, then you'll have a bit of, of a problem. But apparently we had a chance to do this uh, study and the study was um, aimed at assessing the impact of the community connector program that was implemented by FHI 360 in 15 districts of Uganda. 
specifically we wanted to establish if selected interventions had impacted on well intermediate pathway outcomes but as well as the ultimate maternal and child nutrition outcomes so can you go to the next slide please uh, so just to give you a background to the context of the community connector program uh, this is a program that was funded for five years beginning in 2012 not exactly at the beginning of 2012, but they about uh, mid 2012 and ended uh, closed about 2016 at the end mid 2016. It was implemented by FHI 360, just like I said, and it was in collaboration with the local governments in the selected districts and NGOs and community based organizations. The goal was to reduce malnutrition. The goal of uh, community connector program was to reduce malnutrition among the vulnerable populations specifically women of reproductive age and uh, children below five. And it was focused on rural areas following uh, the integrated agriculture nutrition approaches. The point of intervention was not necessarily a household level intervention or governance level or policy level, but it was at the community level. And that was at the parish. And the parish is like the second tier of local governments, governments in Uganda. Uh, so the intervention was focused at parishes, but uh, mostly the pathway was uh, either existing uh, community groups, so to say, you know, women groups, youth groups, farmers groups, and so forth. And where they did not exist, they would uh, create new ones. So, so to say, the groups, the social dimension of, uh, of, of, of trying to reach out so many people with less cost and perhaps not as much effort as you'd need to do when you, um, you, you focus on or you target households. <clears throat> the choice of interventions was informed by um, the needs assessment exercise that was conducted uh, by the community connector itself uh, prior to the intervention or the implementation. And if they found that a certain community lacked extension, agriculture extension messages, that's what they would give. If they did not have, a community did not have improved seedlings or inputs, agriculture inputs, then that's what they would do. Uh, you'd think of um, other aspects like behavior change communication, financial services, dietary practices, and uh, diverse production, diverse agriculture production, and uh, several of, of those kind of, of, of aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so specifically, the community connector wanted to promote the 10CC, what they used to call the 10CCC. Uh, so that involved um, households having a savings with a purpose plan, uh, you know, promoting wash facilities, households having, uh, being able to use uh, you know, pit latrines or toilet facilities, garbage pits and so on. Uh, the, the, the mere fact that a household itself and the homestead compound is clean, there is um, a component of uh, growing fruits and vegetables, particularly those which are nutrient dense, and then um, the source of animal source food, uh, you know, for local consumption, but also if it could be sold for income to support the household. And then there were also others uh, to do with um, an agricultural income activity, call it an apiary, pigare, or whatever. Uh, the use of improved uh, production assets, hose, bangers, and if you know the, those that they did not have. And um, the last two are much more focused on the household itself being able to uh, self-sustain in terms of food, either in the garden or in the store, and that there are signs that you know there is inter intra-household decision-making among household members. Next slide. Okay, so the community connector uh, focused on 15 districts, just like I said. Uh, the seven districts were in Northern Uganda and we had about eight districts in the Western part of the country. And these were districts which were targeted that at that point in time in 2012, and I don't think the situation has changed in any way, they had high malnutrition rates as well as the high prevalence rates of, of poverty. Uh, the districts you see in green are the ones that we randomly selected out of the 15. So these are six to be able to do the impact study. Next slide. 
Um, uh, so in our random sampling of, of districts and, and then sub-counties, we also randomly selected households which would be collecting data from. So we collected data in 2012, which was the baseline before the interventions of Community Connector would be rolled out. And then we we're also able to follow up these households in 2014 and 2016. But overall, uh, we had some level of attrition, but by the end we had about 3,200 3,200 3, households by 2016, and over 12,000 households for whom we were able to do uh, blood samples to test for malaria and hemoglobin, but we're also able to do the body measurements to be able to assess the nutrition situation for those children and women of reproductive age. We were also able to collect a range of other data on social economics, agriculture, nutrition, health, and others. So on the right, the map you're seeing, wherever you see the, those dots, the, uh, the purple dots, I think it's purple, uh, that's where essentially the households were allocated. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the analytical strategy in brief, uh, I think we jumped one. Can you go back a bit? Yes. The strategy we had in place, the analytical strategy, we had several of them, but uh, the background, everything is embedded within the difference in difference approaches uh, using the two main data sets at the beginning, that is at the baseline, but also at uh, the end in 2016. So we're able to compare the households for households at the household level, but also individuals in community connected parishes those treated uh, parishes that receive the interventions and would be able to compare these ones with the control parishes, uh, so to say the ones which did not receive the community connector multi-sectoral interventions. Uh, there were some challenges in identifying these uh, parishes, but we conducted focus group discussions to be able to identify and classify the parishes as would be required. At the beginning, originally from the plan, some parishes actually did not receive uh, the interventions as planned because of different challenges, you know, accessibility, finance, uh, political issues, and so on. So we had to redo this, and that's why it was a bit more um, daunting to do this uh, kind of uh, multi-stakeholder and uh, multi-sector analysis compared to simple analysis that you do over a small period, of, a small period of time, and using maybe a very small sample. So uh, in areas where the treatment happened. So in the community connector parishes, the assumption was that all households would be reached by community dynamics. So if one household is treated or has been reached by the message, the assumption is that this message is going over to these communities. And that's what we also did at the end, try to verify if actually this is what happened. Next slide. <clears throat> So how does the analyt our analytical strategy work? Uh, so it's a difference in difference. So if you look at uh, this diagram on the left uh, vertical axis, you have the outcome. It could be poverty, it could be you know, stunting levels or whatever it is. And then you have the treatment and comparison groups, the treatment in green and uh, comparison in red. So if you consider baseline theoretically, you'd think that these groups should more or less be the same and so to say there shouldn't be any uh, differences. But as you roll out the program that is targeting a certain aspect to be improved, a certain indicator to be improved, then you'd expect that the community that has received um, the treatment or that has been, uh, you know, um, uh, so, so to say the, where the community, the community that has received the intervention gets better. And that's how, <clears throat> sorry, that's when you see the um, green line sort of like jumping up. Now, at the end of the day, in 2016, when you go back to collect the data and you find these differences, the differences you see at the end, subtracted from the, you know, the differences that you'd expect to have happened at the beginning, then that's, that's the measure of the impact, so to say. Uh, so over time, you're able to say that a community A is better than community B, and this can be attributed to the intervention that was conducted. Apparently, this was like the um, uh, <clears throat> this was like the, the the foundation of the analysis, but other econometric methods were applied to control for fixed effects and other things. But of course, that detail is not included in this webinar. 
Next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, given um, the goal of the intervention uh, being uh, targeting the goal being to reduce the malnutrition levels, especially undernutrition for women and children, looking at these results, you might want to think that it was a bit disappointing uh, because of all other indicators, including maternal underweight, uh, child stunting, child underweight, and child anemia, we could not find any impact on these uh, at that point in time when we, we did the end line survey and were able to do the analysis. So we conclude that um, the community connector itself did not significantly improve a range of child and maternal nutrition outcomes, except for maternal anemia, which was reduced by 8%. And this can easily be attributed to the multi-sectoral interventions that were done by the community connector. Next slide. Looking at the intermediary outcomes, uh, it gets a bit interesting here uh, because uh, one of the aspects that the community connector was promoting was uh, the use of improved uh, inputs. But of all the inputs, uh, namely improved seed, fertilizers, organic and inorganic, uh, poultry vaccinations and so on, we only found that the use of inorganic fertilizers was positively affected, influenced, and so there was some level of uh, increased use of fertilizers by the households which were in the community connector villages. And this increased by 3%. Well, in Uganda, the use of fertilizer is roughly about less than 5% nationally. So seeing the 3% increase should be something that can be, yeah, you know, can be praised. Next slide, please. Um, the community connector wanted to improve food production diversity and it is based on the on, on the on the thinking that when you have food for households which have you know less access markets then they should be able to consume what they produce apparently i think this objective was achieved and we see that the total number of species that households grew increased both for crops and livestock as well as if you consider the indices for fowl food groups all these in, in, in improved uh, over that short period of time of roughly four, four five years. Uh, the only group of foods that uh, food crops, um, you know, uh, food groups that uh, were not improved in terms of production were legumes, fruits, and cash crops. Next slide, please. So if they produce it, then do they consume it? Yeah, maybe, yes and no, and for maternal, um, that are diversity, we find that the women in these households improved the consumption of vegetables, which were also uh, improved in terms of production. Meats and dairy products were also improved, and uh, fats and oils. Uh, apparently, legumes, there was some counterintuitive, counterproductive sort of like uh, intervention, but that also does not surprise given the fact that uh, we did not see an improved. Um, improvement in the production of legumes in this in the slide that uh, I just showed before. Next slide. So going over from agriculture to wash habits, we do not see a lot to do with uh, household drinking boiled water, um, uh, hand washing habits, and also toilet facilities. But <clears throat> One aspect that was improved as a result of the community connector was that uh, households which were involved in these sort of like interventions were able to have drying racks for um, drying racks for intensives, and this increased by about 13% for households in the community connector groups. Next. Um, <clears throat> the community connector had um, an aspect to do with uh, saving with a purpose. And that involved social groups being able to uh, create, you know, some sort of like revolving fund within themselves. Apparently, this improved um, the amount of money, the, the, the frequency of saving money in the social groups, but also the ability to receive credit from these social groups. We don't see any uh, effect on households receiving credit from commercial banks. So uh, that also was like um, something that that worked in the in form of intermediary outcomes. Next slide. Uh, 
Antenatal care practices and maternal health seeking behaviors. We see only hospital treatment in case somebody was sick, particularly the mother or the child, and the last birth uh, that was delivered at the hospital. We do not see uh, also, uh, community connector improving uh, the use of insecticide treated nets, but also we don't see it improving the four plus recommended ANC visits at that point in time. Next slide. Okay, so I could have shown many more results because we have a lot of results, but I felt that should be enough uh, for now to just be able to have a discussion and uh, to draw you know, lessons from this broader uh, multi-sexual sort of like evaluation that we did. And this, I thought that would go with some of the messages from the yeah, preceding uh, presentation that I've made, the slides that I've made. Uh, so, Using the case of the aid funded uh, uh, Uganda Community Connector program that was implemented for about five years, we have shown that uh, multi-sectoral programs can potentially improve health and nutrition outcomes of uh, vulnerable populations. In particular, there were substantial improvements in food production diversity, and this led to some level of improved dietary variety. And uh, there were some aspects of positive health uh, seeking behaviors and also improved rural financial services, particularly to do with credit and savings within the groups. So these results point to the positive change in the intermediary outcomes that are necessary to improve, um, uh, you know, to influence better health and nutrition outcomes, but I think only in the long term. So unfortunately, we, we don't have any convincing evidence of improved maternal and child nutrition outcomes, except for maternal anemia that reduced by 8%, which in some way is also, you know, a big magnitude given the situation that uh, majority, you know, about a third of women are under uh, underweight. And, and uh, almost in some districts in Uganda, half of the women of reproductive age are actually um, um, are suffering from maternal anemia. <clears throat> so, Perhaps in our understanding, five years of implementation were not sufficient to cause the desired long-term changes uh, in the nutrition outcomes. Uh, long-term interventions with much maintenance fight and wider coverage of key aspects uh, may lead to more consistent results. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so implementing multi-sector programs is Difficult in some ways, but it's doable and requires you know to have an open mind and have a broad range of uh, technical skills and willingness, willingness to adjust for some individuals and systems. But measuring the impacts as we have done can be a really a big task, uh, quite complex and very challenging. Uh, for the Uganda community, community connector in particular, not all interventions were implemented through the original plan. Uh, some parishes received completely different package that was originally planned. Some parishes only received partial interventions, and some parishes and sub counties actually received no interventions at all. So the analysts had to do a lot of, of, of things, try to tweak things around so that we can get uh, messages that are useful. In particular, I think it's important that the intervention package combinations are you know, really thought about and uh, the optimal and measurable indicators are, uh, are considered. It is also important that uh, we consider a proper control or counterfactual for each of the treatments. And you need to have a wide range of analytical tools, both uh, involving statistical methods, sampling, among others. I'll stop it for now. And I want to thank you all for listening. And to look, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and namaste from Nepal. Uh, it's nice to have you all join us this evening. Next. Uh, at Heifer International, we work with the mission to end hunger and poverty and care for Earth. Next. Uh, over 75 years of our work, we have been able to reach more than 35 million people. Livestock and agriculture has always been uh, 
a key to what we do and we offer tools to communities, uh, livestock assets, trainings, partnerships, and a wide range of tools so that these people, uh, these families can get out of poverty and attain sustainable, sustainable livelihoods. Next. In Nepal, uh, uh, we have been active since last 23 years, and we've been able to reach close to 300,000 families, 227 cooperatives. Uh, our engagement with the... Next slide, please. Uh, the way we structure our work is we look at uh, um, that the families will increase income and asset, food security, and the work we do uh, has, does not add additional pressure to the environment. We are very specific about uh, uh, climate agriculture. The other major piece of work we do is we, uh, we um, work around people. Um, we help uh, people like um, to uh, discover their own self. So what we have seen in our work is, apart from all the technical work we do, um, what actually uh, brings impact is the ability of people to make it happen. So it's the people who make it happen. So at Heifer, we do invest a lot in helping people discover their own potentials, the resources around them, build their own um, groups, institutions, and build a social capital. And women empowerment has always been a central piece of the work we do around people. But we always had questions around um, which part of our program, which diamonds you know, does contribute to the impact that we are looking for? I mean, because these uh, comprehensive multi-sectoral programs are complex, expensive, time taken, taking. So we had various um, uh, questions around like what works best and uh, when we approach other donors and collaborate also we had questions around like, uh, which is which aspect do you think will will contribute to the impacts that you are looking for? Next, uh, and, and in recent years we also added uh, market development, system change, access to finance, uh, in the I mean, enhancing uh, investment to the to the farmers and community work work we do. Uh, so, as I said, like we had questions around which aspects of the work um, is actually contributing to the impacts that are looking for. The, our work with NIL has helped us um, look in, in those aspects. Uh, uh, we have been engaged for a long time, and then we specifically uh, looked at what was interested to learn how the work we do has been uh, having impact on and the child nutrition and child health. So very quickly, we learned that uh, we needed more focus on um, specific nutrition activities. So that element was added. And um, it also allowed uh, to like dig deeper and uh, dissect different aspects of the work we do. And the um, findings we've got has helped us to do a better programming in Nepal and across heifer, uh, heifer countries and also approach the, I mean, work with the government in Nepal, uh, especially uh, the, the um, departments that work around agriculture uh, to engage in the, those conversations. How can agriculture have a, ha, I mean, have an, that um, should be programmed in a way that will have more impact in the nutritional outcomes that we will, uh, that we ex aspire for. Um, uh, Dr. Laurie Miller has been engaged with us uh, from a long time and helping us uh, put together um, these studies uh, with the help of NIL. And uh, in the following slides, um, Dr. Miller will be uh, I mean, looking at the different findings we had and the questions that we had and the answers we got. Um, I over to you, Dr. Miller. Well, thanks, Nina, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, a big hello to everyone from uh, me to you. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, as you've heard from Nina, uh, there was a basic program at Heifer. Next slide. 
which involved uh, livelihoods and uh, livestock resource management, social capital development, accountability, and uh, focused heavily on sustainability and self-reliance. Next slide. And with this in mind, we began our work together in asking the question, what happens to child growth and diet in a multi-sectoral program that doesn't address these areas? And over time, we came to a second research question, which is our second uh, project that I'll present. And we asked, is it the training or the livestock donation? Is it the community development? What part of the heifer program is the most important to the child outcomes? Next. We, along the way, observe some unintended consequences and some lessons learned that I'd like to share with you. Next. So our first research question is shown again here on this slide. What happens to child growth and diet in a multi-sectoral program that doesn't address these areas? And as a corollary to this, we also ask, does Heifer's program improve livelihoods as it's designed to do? Next. For our first project, we enrolled 415 households in three districts in Nepal, two in the Tarai and one in the hills. We used a staggered introduction design where the intervention group got the heifer program in inputs for the entire 48 months of the project and the control group got the heifer program started after 12 months. Next. I can tell you just briefly, the intervention did work. On this slide, you can see the improvement in household income and household wealth score over the 48 months of the project. Next. Even though this uh, heifer input program did not have any uh, nutritional components, we found to our surprise that there were some improvements in child nutrition. In other words, child minimal dietary diversity and ASF consumption improved in relation to the duration of exposure to the intervention. As you see here, the children's minimal dietary diversity consumption increased by almost fourfold and ASF consumption by about two and a half fold. Next. Again, there was no focus on child growth, but we observed over the 48 months that there was a decrease in the percent of children with underweight, with stunting and with wasting. Next. We realize that these changes take time. And I wanna emphasize that on the next slide. Here you see the impact of the intervention on growth. Along the horizontal axis is the number of months of exposure to the heifer program, 12 months, 24 months, and 48 months. And on the vertical axis, you see the beta coefficient for height for age and weight for age z-score, respectively in blue and orange. You can see that although the height for age z-score improved significantly at 12 months, it doubled at 24 months, and this uh, improvement was sustained at 48 months. In contrast, the weight for age z-score took a lot of time. It was going up, but didn't reach a significant level of improvement until 48 months. Next slide. This and other findings made us really start to focus on what was going on between the heifer inputs and the outputs that we were measuring. In other words, what were the factors at the child level and the family level, at the household level that influenced the outputs that we were looking at? Next slide. One of the things we wanted to address to answer this was the mother's educational level. Here you see the household wealth score in relation to the mother's educational level. In blue, mothers who had no education, in red, primary education, and in green, secondary education. While there was a trend to go up for all of these uh, groups, you can see that the mothers who had secondary education uh, had households with a greater improvement in their wealth score over time. Next slide. This shows the change in diet diversity over time, again, in relation to the mother's educational level. We were pleased the child diet diversity improved in all of these groups, but at 48 months, there was a much greater improvement in the children of mothers who had secondary education. Next slide. As you see here as a footnote, this was the change in diet diversity if there was no adult in the household with any formal education. Next slide. 
This brought us to the burning question, why and how does the livestock and livelihood intervention affect child growth and diet? Next. We developed our second research project focusing on the following questions. Is it the training and livestock donation? Is it the community development? What part of the heifer program, in other words, provides the secret sauce that's important to child outcomes? Next. As Nina mentioned, uh, after the first project, it was realized that uh, the nutrition could be improved and the nutrition training could be improved. So a nutrition curriculum was developed by Heifer and we incorporated this into our second research project. Next. This project enrolled 974 households all in the Banki district the households were randomized into three community clusters. Next. The first cluster received what we called the full heifer package. This included the typical social capital development and livestock training that heifer has been doing traditionally and also incorporated the new nutrition training curriculum. Next. We also had a partial package group that got the nutrition training and the livestock training. Next and a control group which did not receive any of these inputs. Next. We collected five household surveys over nearly three years and typical household indicators such as land ownership, animal ownership, wealth, and so on were collected along with child indicators including anthropometry, health, and diet quality. Next. This slide shows the results of the change from baseline to end line in the households related to their group assignment. In green, the control group. In blue, those who received the full heifer package. And in purple, those who received the partial heifer package. You can see that for wealth, soap use, household diet diversity score, and food security, households in the full heifer package had much greater improvement over the uh, period of this study. Next. We next constructed a mixed effect regression model which adjusted for child and household factors at the child level, age, gender, and baseline anthropometry, and at the household factor, animal and land ownership, wealth, and women's education. Next. I'll summarize the results on the following few slides. Being in the heifer full package group predicted better growth outcomes for weight, height, and weight for height Z scores. Next. Being in the heifer full package predicted greater improvement in child diet quality, both diet diversity and ASF consumption. Next. And being in the heifer full package predicted greater improvement in child health, fewer episodes of diarrhea, respiratory illness, and fever. Next. We then went to look at our partial package intervention to see how they compared. They looked like the control group for most of the variables assessed, but next, there was a surprise because some child outcomes looked worse in the partial package group than in the control. Next, I'll show you two examples. Here's the first one. Children in the partial package households had worse development at age two years. In this study, we were able to do child developmental testing on a subset of children. And for the group of children tested at age two, you can see the results on this slide. The uh, child development score beta coefficient is shown on the y-axis. And the results indicate that the children who were in partial package households had about 14 points lower on their developmental score than the control group. In contrast, children who were in the full heifer package had 15 points higher. Next slide. We also found that households that were assigned to the partial package group had worse home child rearing quality. Here you can see that households in the control and the full package had about the same uh, home child rearing quality score, but that in the partial package group was much lower. Next. These findings suggest that perhaps an incomplete or poorly integrated, poorly designed program may be worse than no program at all and reminds us that we have to first do no harm when we uh, conduct or implement interventions. Next. 
In summary, both better outcomes were seen in families which received the heifer full package intervention at both the child and the household level. At the household, there were greater increases in wealth, hygiene, diet diversity, and food security. And for the child, there was more improvement in growth, diet quality, and health. Next. Couple of take home messages from our first project, we found that multi-sectoral interventions can affect non-targeted sectors, that personal and household qualities relate to the response to interventions, and it takes time to appreciate the impact of complicated multi-sectoral interventions. Next. From the second project, we can say that multi-sectoral interventions, including a social capital component as administered by Heifer, were associated with a more favorable household and child outcomes than just the identical training provided alone. Also, that incomplete programs may have unintended and unfavorable consequences. Next. Finally, intensive multi-sectoral interventions may be more effective in creating measurable and sustainable improvements in important child and household outcomes. Next. And as Nina mentioned, I emphasize that these are more costly, difficult, and time-consuming to implement. Next. I want to acknowledge the organizations shown on this slide. A big thanks to Sumanta Nupani for the heavy lifting and the statistics. Thanks also to the participating family and to USAID for uh, supporting this work. Thank you. All right. Um, so now I will be presenting on um, an analysis that is from the Bangladesh Aquaculture and Horticulture for Nutrition Research Study. Uh, next slide. This was a longitudinal panel study conducted in the Feed the Future Zone of Influence, which includes parts of Barishal, Kuna, and Dhaka divisions in southwest Bangladesh. And the study included just over 3,000 households with at least one child under five years of age and were visited a total of three times at six month intervals over the course of the study. There were three main components to each visit, an interview with the household head, an interview with the female caregiver or mother of the child under five, and anthropometry assessments of the child and mother or female caregiver. Among many other topics, household heads were interviewed on their agriculture and aquaculture practices, and mothers were interviewed on diets, food and non-food expenditure, illness, nutrition knowledge, and nutrition-related practices. Finally, mothers and children's height, weight, and mid-upper arm circumference were measured at each time point. Next slide. One of the objectives of the study was to understand if there is a benefit to engaging in multiple types of agriculture compared to one single type or none. We focused on aquaculture and horticulture, looking at the association between households' engagement in these types of agriculture and the diets of mothers and children. More specifically, we wanted to know if mothers and children who lived in households that engaged in both aquaculture and horticulture had more diverse diets and if they were more likely to consume protein rich and other nutrient dense foods like animal source foods, legumes, fruits, and vegetables. Furthermore, we wanted to know if mothers and diets, mothers and children with better diets were likely to have better nutrition outcomes by way of height, weight, MUAC, Z-scores, and BMI. Uh, and for this analysis, we only included children six months of age or older due to the changing diets um, at such a young age. Next slide. We defined aquaculture engagement as producing fish from a pond, but not from ocean or any open water source. And horticulture engagement was defined as producing fruits and or vegetables from an agriculture plot or a homestead plot. The majority of households that produced fruits or vegetables in the study did so from a homestead plot. This pie chart shows engagement pulled from all three rounds. As you can see, about a quarter of the study households engaged in both aquaculture and horticulture, only 1% in only aquaculture, almost 60% in only horticulture, while almost 15% of study households engaged in neither aquaculture nor horticulture. For the main variable of interest, we combined the aquaculture only and horticulture only groups to create a three category vari engagement variable, neither referring to not producing fish or fruits and or vegetables, 
either referring to only producing fish or fruits and or vegetables, and both referring to producing fish and fruits and or vegetables. Next slide. The dietary diversity variables used in this analysis were created from counts of food groups consumed in the past 24 hours, similar to the infant and young child feeding minimum dietary diversity indicator and the minimum dietary diversity for women indicator. The data in this study were not collected in a way to be actually be able to create these validated indicators. The food groups included in the dietary diversity indicators were grains, legumes, dairy, meat, fish, and poultry, eggs, and fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables were combined for children and separated for mothers, and a cutoff of four or more food groups was used for both. An increase in dietary diversity was observed over the study period with a 17 percentage point increase in children consuming four or more food groups and a 12 percentage point increase in mothers between the first and last round. Next slide. Looking at individual nutrient-dense food groups, we see low consumption of animal source foods except for fish, where about half of children and almost 60% of mothers consumed fish. Though rates are low, more children consume dairy and eggs than mothers, and about 30% of children and mothers consumed legumes. Fruit consumption is also quite low, while almost, almost all children and mothers reported consuming vegetables. Data on dark green leafy vegetable and vitamin A rich fruits and vegetable consumption were not collected in the first round. So the data presented here are pooled from the second and third rounds. Over 40% of children and almost half of mothers consumed dark green leafy vegetables, while only about 10% of children and mothers consumed other vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. Next slide. And finally, here are some descriptives on nutritional outcomes. We see that the prevalence of stunting decreased over the study period, while wasting and underweight increased slightly. Mother's BMI shows the increasing double burden of malnutrition in Bangladesh, as almost 40% of the non-pregnant mothers in the study had overweight or obesity. About 16% were underweight, and almost half were in the normal weight category. Next slide. Now for the results. We conducted linear and logistic mixed effects models controlling for survey design and sampling weights. Child models were adjusted for child's age, sex, household wealth, and survey round, while mother models were adjusted for household wealth and survey round. A purchase variable was included in all models, mirroring the outcome variable. For example, in the models with the count of food groups consumed as the dependent variable, the purchase variable is the count of food groups purchased by the household. We also included an interaction of purchase and aquaculture and horticulture engagement to account for the varying effect of engagement and purchasing on consumption. In this first table of results, we found significant positive associations between aquaculture and horticulture engagement and the number of food groups consumed. We also found significant associations with consuming four or more food groups for both children and mothers where living in both engagement households was associated with having a more diverse diet. We found a similar effect of both engagement and purchase on consuming four or more food groups. In households that did not purchase, children were 2.4 times more likely to consume four or more food groups if they lived in households with both engagement. Similarly, in households with no engagement, children were 2.1 times more likely to consume four or more food groups if the household purchased four or more food groups. Combining these effects, children in households with both engagement and who did purchase were 3.2 times more likely to consume four or more food groups. In the same way, mothers in households with both engagement who did not purchase were two times more likely to meet the four food group threshold, while mothers in both engagement households who did purchase were 2.8 times more likely to consume. Next slide. We found similar results for consuming animal source foods. As you can see in the columns on the left, living in both engagement households was found to be positively associated with consuming more types of animal source food for children and mothers. When it comes to consuming NAASF, we found a stronger association with both engagement households than purchasing. Compared to children in neither engagement households who did not purchase, children in households um, with both engagement, uh, sorry, 
uh, compared to children in neither engagement households who did not purchase, children in households with neither engagement who did purchase were 1.8 times more likely to consume ASFs. Children in households with both engagement who did not purchase were 2.4 times more likely to consume, while children in both engagement households who did purchase were 2.7 times more likely to consume any ASF. Likewise, Mothers in households with both engagement who did not purchase were 2.2 times more likely to consume ASFs, and mothers in both engagement households who did purchase were 2.1 times more likely to consume ASFs. And we, this is most likely due to the fact that both engagement households consumed fish that they produced. Next slide. When an individual animal source foods were analyzed separately, we found that children and mothers in both engagement households were significantly more likely con to consume each animal source food than those in neither engagement households. The engagement and purchasing interaction was significant for children and mothers with regard to consuming fish, meat or poultry, and dairy, and only for mothers with regard to eggs. Children in both engagement households that did not purchase were 2.1 times more likely to consume fish and those in both engagement households that did purchase were slightly more likely at 2.3 times to consume fish. For meat or poultry, children in both engagement households who did purchase were 4.3 times more likely to consume compared to 1.4 times more likely for children in both engagement households that did not purchase. Most notably, children in both engagement households who did purchase were 18 times more likely to consume dairy compared to 2.4 times more likely for children in both engagement households that did not purchase. These results highlight the reliance on purchasing for many animal source foods, especially meat and dairy, as few households owned livestock. Next slide. Finally, we examined consumption of fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Starting with legumes, we found a significant association between consumption and living in both engagement households for children and mothers, where they were 1.4 times more likely to consume legumes compared to those living in neither engagement households. Significant associations were also found with fruit, where mothers and children in both engagement households were almost two times more likely to consume fruit compared to those in neither engagement households. The interaction of purchase and engagement was significant for children showing that children in households with both engagement and who did purchase were four times more likely to consume fruit than those in neither engagement households who did not purchase. We did not find any significant relationships with vegetable consumption, and this could be due to the fact that the vast majority of study participants reported consuming vegetables. Next slide. Now, did we find that better diets were associated with better nutrition outcomes? For this analysis, we used the binary dietary diversity indicator of consuming four or more food groups. We found that child's height was, was positively associated with meeting the four food group threshold, where children who consumed four or more food groups were on average 0.1 centimeters taller than children who consumed less than four food groups. Though this coefficient is quite small, this result shows that consuming a diverse diet is one of many contributors to child growth. Unfortunately, we did not find significant relationships between dietary diversity and other nutritional outcomes for children or mothers. Next slide. In conclusion, we observed that increasing prevalence of consuming dietary diverse diets over the study period contrasted with low consumption of many nutrient dense foods. A decrease in stunting was also observed as well as a positive association between more diverse diets and an increase in child's height. For many food groups, there was a significant interaction between engagement and purchasing, showing the important role that both production and purchasing have on consuming different foods, as well as the increased purchasing power that households have when engaged in multiple types of agriculture. Finally, we did find a benefit to engaging in both aquaculture and horticulture for children and mothers. This was positively associated with more diverse diets as well as consuming individual food groups of fish, meat or poultry, dairy, eggs, legumes, and fruit. Only one food group, dairy, was associated with engaging in either aquaculture or horticulture, showing that there is an advantage to engaging in multiple types of agriculture. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for the presentations. That's um, wonderful to hear from our panel. 
um, and we have lots of questions uh, that have been um, uh, put forward by our participants. Uh, so I would like to um, start by uh, maybe with, with Nussel's presentation. Um, there are a couple of areas that there's uh, interest in, um, particularly regarding the um, fertilizer. So there were questions on um, why the inorganic fertilizer was the only one that uh, um, showed increase. And was that because it was cheaper or was it because um, it was provided by the group, um, by, the, by the project? And, um, and there's another question which is similar, which is whether there was any subsidy provided for the purchase of the fertilizer. So um, perhaps you could clarify some of these uh, questions, Nasu. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think there was a similar question under WASH, and that was to do with why don't we see changes in WASH habits and toilet use? Thing. Now, what I really realized with the community connector implementation was that those new things that people had not had a chance to hear about most, like use of fertilizer and demonstration that fertilizer can improve yields, uh, the use of you know drying racks, which was never heard of before, those really caught the attention of the communities. So there was no subsidy, there was no free fertilizer that was given to farmers. It was just extension messages and um, behavior change messages. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, there's another question, actually a couple of questions that were associated with the, well, the finding that um, you've, your project found a reduction in anemia. So um, the questions are um, whether this prevalence was due to the project specifically or whether you think it was influenced by um, iron supplementation or other for other reasons. Um, and also that um, you, did you find that there was any association with the change in uh, anemia levels and the consumption of animal source foods and particularly um, the question is uh, an increase in meat consumption. Yeah, thank you again for that question. Uh, I think um, what, what you really see in the intervention is that uh, households improve, uh, first and foremost, uh, medical access. Uh, you know, people get to know that they, they need to access medical facilities for, you know, for anemia, uh, for iron supplementation, but also the food production diversity that, again, influence the consumption of these women of, you know, meat, dairy products, but also fruits and vegetables. And that, in a way, should have reduced you know, Im impacted on the reduction of maternal anemia. In terms of whether there are some other, you know, effects from outside, I think that can be explained. But in our analysis, we tried to control for several other factors. And at the beginning, when you look at the anemia rates in the control groups, as well as in the intervention groups, they actually don't differ. So there could have been some effect, effect as a result of an external intervention beyond the community connector. But in our analysis, we try to control for quite a number of things, distance to facilities and all these things and how much messages you get. And that in itself should be able to tell us that we have some fairly good estimation that this reduction was more to do with the community, community connector than anything else. Well, it's 8%. So even if you take off some other in, you know, effects from other interventions, it could still come to about three or 4%. And that's still not something small in terms of the number of people that are being uh, reached. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Nasu. Um, Nina, uh, there are um, questions that uh, have been um, posed to you regarding the project. So um, I think there's a, a, disc a question about the length time that these projects take to really show change. 
And, you know, when you talk about four years of the intervention, um, is it sufficient? Um, and there was a question about, do you think it's the time factor or do you think it's the way we're designing um, our projects that uh, require more time to fulfill? Um, and I, you know, I think um, that's uh, linked to, um, you know, when we, we look at uh, the impact evaluations, we saw that there was quite a big change in the uh, in Laurie's presentation, quite a big change in year four. So, um, do you, why do you think um, it takes time to find these changes? Thank you. Um, uh, let me try to answer that question. One thing, as I mentioned, was what we have learned is the people piece of the whole work which we call the social capital building. That is key uh, for a lot of um, other um, results to see. That's, that was very evident from the study we did. And, and that change, uh, that engagement of people takes a very long time. Heifer um, uh, uh, does have a model which we called values-based holistic community development. It starts with um, helping individual um, uh, reflect on their own self, like coming into group and then uh, uh, coming together and doing uh, participatory reviews and making plans. And so that piece of work, uh, it's, it, it is that prepares um, uh, in our program design, what we've seen is that prepares these people, these communities, these families to um, observe uh, other technical aspects of the things that we put uh, forward to them. So this um, change at individual level and their coming into a group and working as a group, this is a pretty slow process. So, and and it, 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 it has to follow a whole cycle in order to see um, these people being excited about what they do and then uh, uh, taking initiatives to reach out to other resources, long process. So that piece of social capital building, uh, which we do through our values-based approach uh, is, uh, is uh, quite a, a time-taking process, but we've seen that taking that time and investing resources in that piece of the work we do has been very rewarding. Yes, thank you. So the um, the environment uh, and the enabling environment is critical to um, substantial change. Um, and that leads on to another question, which is um, how you engaged with the different line ministries and how were the how were those um, different government um, stakeholders involved in implementation? Um, and in ownership, and then the sustainability, the move to sustainability. Did you have a process that um, engaged the, uh, the government? Yes. Um, so our work begins with uh, uh, and um, so um, in the context of Nepal, it's much easier now that we have a. Um, a local government that has much more authority, but even uh, before, like that was key. Like the way we approached um, them was, uh, this is what we can do and what can you contribute? So that has always been our strategy. So we, uh, we engaged heavily and also um, invited them to invest um, in terms of uh, their resources. Uh, that was a key for engagement of local governments. We always went with, this is what we can do and what do you have? And they do have their um, uh, local budgets allocated for nutrition, for women, for agriculture development. So it's a matter of like uh, sitting together and uh, getting through th those long tedious rounds of uh, planning processes, uh, but it's very rewarding. So what uh, uh, eventually what we have seen is uh, when we do those planning processes of the local government in a right way, 
um, they we've seen them being very enthusiastic about uh, putting their resources. Once they put their resources um, in the project, and that's where they started to start to get interest. And we do have the we have designed the management structure in such a way that the representative local government government gov, government is a part of that managed director, which we call what we call that uh, we call in our language. Um, 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 PMIC and the key factor is we engage them in planning, uh, we invite them to put their resources and we, we engage them in monitoring and then providing feedbacks. That's how they all get ownership. And then when they, they, they see results happening, coming and they, they definitely take ownership and want to expand to other locations in their uh, local government. So that's at the local government. In, in, in national um, level, we have very, uh, very uh, close contact uh, and coordination with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. And from there, we, we branch out to other um, uh, related stakeholders. So they sit on our technical coordination committees. Uh, we frequently invite them to um, visit uh, our uh, communities and provide feedbacks. And we have this uh, very intensive discussion on when we design programs and what are the government priorities and what can, where we can add value. So, so that piece of um, engagement of government at all levels, specifically at the local level has been key on um, the sustainability and also this, um, um, their ownership and their um, creating this enabling environment. The other aspect of engaging the government is uh, uh, the other policy aspects. Like um, in several places, we've seen that um, the 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 policy that cross cuts uh, cross cuts across many sectors they conflict with each other. So bringing this into conversation has um, helped in elevating that bottlenecks uh, from the policy advocacy side also. And on the local government side, we've seen them investing, uh, allocating resources uh, to the programs which they think um, are uh, giving them results. Great, thank you. Thank you. And so um, I don't know if uh, either you or Laurie would like to um, answer a couple of questions here. One is on um, when, with the increase of beta carotene rich foods, papaya, pumpkin, et cetera, were efforts made to measure child's consumption? Um, that's one question. Um, I can answer that uh, quickly. Yes, thanks, uh, Laurie, yeah. yeah. We certainly measured that uh, the individual food groups, but we did not measure quantities. Right. Okay. Uh, so you measured food groups and child's consumption of the right. food groups. That's yeah. right. Okay. And we also Great. collected information about whether certain items, individual food uh, groups were available in the household to other family members. So okay. we've been able to look at the difference between food allocation in these households as well. Right. So then um, specifically on this nutrition training, because I, uh, you mentioned that um, you found that there was this uh, change in consumption, what specific nutrition training was provided in the package, um, in the heavy yeah, package? I and who were the target groups for that training? Right, no, that's a great question. And I, I kind of glossed over that uh, just in the interest of time, but the uh, nutrition curriculum is 10 modules focused on child and family nutrition and uh, just basic food messages and recipes and demonstrations and a lot of practical work. And this nutrition curriculum is uh, administered, if you will, by um, facilitators who attend the women's self-help groups. So as Nina explained, uh, all of these complicated interventions, most of them are based in women's self-help groups that meet pretty much on a bi-weekly basis during the time of the intervention. And so the facilitators would bring the nutrition curriculum into that setting. And so it was basically mm -hmm. the mothers, although people always say, are men allowed to come to these 
women's self-help group? And the answer is yes, they are, but they're not really there very much. So basically the targets are the mothers who are in this context, mostly in charge of uh, feeding the children and selecting the food items to give to the children. Okay, thank you. Um, there was um, also a question on um, if you were to redesign the impact evaluation, what are the specific things you would change? Are there any things you would change based on what you know now? Hmm. Well, that's that's a provocative question. I think we could always uh, always look back and wish we had done things differently. But uh, to me, one of the important findings was uh, what was going on in this partial package group. And I think we could have looked at them in a lot more detail and maybe collected some separate kind of information about their attitudes or their, um, their uh, feelings as the project went forward and, and they were getting this limited training. Right. So, um, so in the package, um, so was somebody actually at one of our participants has asked um, about the full package and what that had. And we could maybe combine that with, are there any child rearing quality or child development um, aspects that you feel were critical for the social capital package? Well, Nina, you can uh, chime in here anytime, but uh, the, the full package really still does not talk about uh, child development in a particular way. So that was an interesting kind of fallout of the project that the child development in that group of two-year-olds looked better in the families that had received the full package intervention. So that, that remains um, something that is worth, worthy of further exploration, I think. Uh, the nutrition was definitely, the nutrition curriculum was definitely focused on children and ASF consumption, dietary diversity, and all the infant young child feeding practices that are recommended. So that was the, that was the core messaging that was provided in the nutrition curriculum. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, there's another question on whether you think um, there was um, influence in, you know, when you looked at your evaluation, um, influence from other projects in the area, for example, Suhara or the multi-sector nutrition plan rollout by the government that may have also influenced um, the outcomes. Yeah, well, it's a tough time to be doing research in Nepal, right? Because there were a lot of programs right. active and exactly. I think everyone has yeah. been dealing with that. Uh, we were in a part of the Banki district that was not part of Suhara. So that doesn't uh, mean that people didn't have friends who uh, were receiving those inputs and interventions. That doesn't mean people didn't hear the radio messaging and so on. So we really didn't have a, a good way to control for that, uh, that uh, potential uh, impact. But uh, we felt that that was probably equalized among our three groups. Um, and I should say that those three groups were geographically separated from each other. So there, we were trying to minimize crosstalk between the groups, but certainly right. in the context of Nepal at the time, there was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and um, is there anything that you would say was um, a real um, winner in the package from your perspective? Well, I think it's it's something we need to um, understand better because as you've heard from Nina, she explained it so beautifully, what a complicated program Heifer offers at so many levels. And it's really, as she said, it's changing the mentality of individuals and giving tools to uh, move forward with uh, what's available. and. That's a fascinating process. And I think we could all learn more about how that really works. Um, mm -hmm. The fallout from those personal changes and that development of a sense of agency and ability to, uh, to make change is uh, really important. And how that happens, that's what I'm calling the secret sauce because I think it's kind of uh, in a, 
magical change that happens in, in individuals and in families. And mm -hmm. we all need to know more about how that really works. Great, thank you. Um, uh, to Katie, um, I've got uh, a couple of questions. We've got a couple of questions here looking at the aquaculture work that was done and um, and what are some of the challenges in, in introducing and implementing aquaculture for small holder farmers and, and um, how can you go about establishing this effectively for smallholder families um, and even in combination with, um, with poultry care? That is a great question. Um, our study was an observational study and so we, it wasn't an intervention. So we didn't actually um, introduce aquaculture um, into these okay. communities. Um, there are many USAID programs active in the communities um, that promote aquaculture and horticulture engagement and um, are active in increasing the, um, the number of households that participate in these types of agriculture. Um, and we unfortunately didn't have data on whether or not the households in our study participate in those programs, but are kind of using these results as um, evidence that USAID should continue promoting both aquaculture and horticulture. Okay. That they're, a, that they're a worthwhile combination. Exactly, yes. Um, and then I have um, a question here on whether you looked at women's time use um, and whether there were these demands that put on women's time um, added to their overall um, daily demand. Um, and um, just thinking about the adverse results of the ASQ at age two of the children in, in the in the partial package. So um, how did you find um, women's time? Is that for me or for Laura? Sorry. This says Bang oh, Bangladesh. Sorry, That's Laurie. A, yeah, <laughs> OK. Uh, we did not um, look specifically at women's time use. And uh, that is certainly an important uh, piece because uh, we uh, we were interested in how that would affect child development and the partial package people had a time commitment as well because they were involved with the training it was not as extensive a time commitment as the full package group but they had a time commitment so the question comes up why was there a difference and uh, was it perhaps because the women in the full package group not only had more time involved with their activities, but they felt empowered and maybe that led to better parenting quality in some way. Or alternatively, one could hypothesize that the family members of the women who were in the full package group were enthusiastic about the project because although it's directed towards women, it's really the full family that gets involved. So maybe they put mm the slack and they said well you know she's at her uh, heifer group and uh, I'm going to take care of the baby this afternoon because uh, uh, she's busy with something else so it's some sort of a balance um, in that manner okay yes thank you um, I see Katie you're typing the answer um, on why agriculture specifically but um, I, I think it might be um, useful to really look at where aquaculture is um, an appropriate intervention because it does so rely on access to water and you know in some um, settings in some countries water is really an issue and how you manage that particularly um, in um, smallholder families. Yeah, exactly. Um, Bangladesh is very, um, low lying at sea, sea level, the um, part of Bangladesh that we were active in was um, in the southwest portion, so bordering the ocean. So there's a lot of flooding and just there's a lot of water there. So it's a, it's a really um, suitable area for 
aquaculture and is really important in the livelihoods of many people that live there. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, conducive environments are so important and so critical um, when you're working with, with smallholder families. Um, as you know, the whole project can be at risk if there's not enough, uh, if there's not enough to sustain it. Um, so I think we've actually come to the end of our Q&A time. Um, and thank you if I've missed any questions, um, please uh, make sure that uh, you note those um, again in the question box and we can um, respond to you. Uh, the, the panel members can respond to you um, at, a, uh, at a later time. So before we close out for the session, um, first of all, I'd like to really thank our participants. Thank you so much for your engagement and um, the time you uh, spent in listening to the, the presentations, which actually don't almost adequately reflect the enormous amount of work that went into um, doing the research, conducting the programs during the research um, and uh, the analysis and preparing everything. So uh, a big thank you to our, um, our panelists and, um, and for the programs that you, that you worked with and the teams that were involved. Um, before we go, I'd also like to give you a kind of each of our presenters um, a sort of 30 second closing thought that um, that our uh, participants can take away with them. And um, to, to start that off, I would like to go to Katie first. Um, Katie, do you have um, your takeaway highlight for the participants? Yeah. Well Again, thank you all for, for joining today. It's been a very interesting and insightful um, session. And just wanted to highlight our main findings that the combination of aquaculture and horticulture is very improvement, or very important to improving the diversity and um, overall diets of women and children. Um, and though we didn't see a you know, significant um, result with many of the nutritional outcomes. It just highlights how complex nutritional outcomes are and how many um, factors there are that are needed to address to achieve sustained improvements. Thank you, Katie. Um, Laurie, what's your main thought? Okay, well, uh... For the donors who might be listening, I just want to emphasize it takes time to see change and uh, it's important to allow adequate time to uh, do uh, appropriate follow up and it is a it's complicated to work with these multi sectoral projects from a research point of view I want to echo what Nasul said, which is uh, control group is really important and we have to have an appropriate control for the kind of work that this is and uh, from a research standpoint also, I think it'd be really helpful and fascinating to try to make a more granular assessment of what some of these components of social capital development really are and how they really impact uh, the outcomes of particularly for children. And thanks to everybody for uh, your great questions and for being here with us today. Thanks, Laurie. Over to you, Nina. Hi, Nina. Are you there to give us your closing thought? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. We, we okay, so yeah. the connection has been unstable here. So thank you. This has been a very engaging conversation. Great questions. I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I'm going to emphasize what Laurie just said. Um, uh, it's complex. It's time-taking. So we need to have patience and then willingness to um, allocate enough resources and time uh, in order to uh, see the intended outcome. And our work has shown that um, engagement of people 
is key. So the social capital piece of work um, uh, we've done, uh, I think that's um, the secret sauce. So until we get people excited and engaged and set a process where they can um, embody the uh, learnings or the knowledge that we want to impart, that is key to um, whatever technical um, knowledge interventions that we make. So engaging people, understanding them, and, and their uh, coming on board is very important. So creating that social capital piece is, um, we think, uh, very important. That should not be ignored in any, any program. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Nasul, your closing thought. First and foremost, Adele, thank you for the excellent moderation of this session. I think I have learned a lot also from my colleagues. Uh, I think my views are not any different from what Laura and um, Nina said, um, but for me, it has been an exciting time uh, working on this project as somebody who is inquisitive, but also, you know, you're working at the um, at the intersection of action research, but also needing to have the real answers uh, to several other people that would not have them. What I've learned over time is that you really don't get people to change in a very short time. So you need to keep bombarding them with this kind of information. And the forum like the one we have today is important. So you, you imagine that you know, we have results from Uganda, we have results from Nepal, Bangladesh, and, and, and so on. And you, they tend all to be focusing to, to the same sort of like, uh, they're pointing the same sort of like results and conclusions. If we had ways of reaching out to so many people, especially in the policy making and programming, then I think would make, um, you know, um, a, a much bigger impact than just talking about it in the way we are talking about it and sharing knowledge and so on. So we really need to reach out. That's like my, my key point. So thank you so much. Again, thank you so much Tufts for managing this project and uh, several others. And thank you for organizing this webinar. About you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to our organizers, uh, Tufts University, to Devon and uh, Grace and the team. And, uh, and thank you so much to the participants. And have a good rest of the day or evening.